Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Peterson Institute for International Economics. I'm Adam Posen, the Institute's president, and it's our distinct privilege today to host a speech and discussion with Paolo Gentiloni, the European Commissioner for Economy, one of the leaders of Europe in this time of genuine crisis in the near abroad. This speech is part of what we call Macro Week 2022 here at the Peterson Institute. We've been very fortunate to have a range of officials from around the world, including from Europe, the Vice President of Spain, Nadia Colvino, earlier this week, uh, today, Commissioner Gentiloni, and tomorrow, the ECB President, Christine Lagarde. We hope you'll join us for those events, either live by a webcast or posted on the Macro Week 2022 page on PIIE, as well as many places around the web. This morning, Commissioner Gentiloni will speak on rising to the challenge, transatlantic economic policy in times of war. Um, that may sound somewhat broad, but I think the significance of the words transatlantic and times of war is very great. That is something that the European Commission and frankly G7 policymakers have not had to confront and speaking about transatlantic has generally been secondary. And so to have the commissioner and his colleagues speaking in those terms right now is, I think, crucial. Paolo Gentiloni has been serving as the European Commissioner for Economy since December 2019, so just before COVID. And he's a former prime minister of Italy, having been the prime minister from December 2016 to June 2018. I think we're all grateful that he has continued his public service at the commission after holding that role. He was previously a member of the Italian Chamber of Deputies from 2001 to 2019 and had been foreign minister as well as minister of communications in his native Italy. Commissioner Gentiloni is also a published author, a former professional journalist, and holds a degree in political sciences from La Sapienza University in Rome. We've had much interaction with him and with the team at DG ECFIN at the Commission through the years, and I'm grateful to welcome Commissioner Gentiloni to the Peterson Institute stage today. Paolo. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good, good morning, and thank you, Adam, for your introduction. Pleasure to be in DC and to be at the Peterson Institute for the first time in person. Um, even if, in, unfortunately, the audience is, is still virtual, it is right to remain prudent and to remind ourselves that the pandemic is not yet over, one step at a time. It is now almost two months since Russia's unprovoked and unjustified invasion of Ukraine two months of indiscriminate killings, bombings of civilians' targets, and absolutely shocking violence, two months of a war happening just across the EU and NATO borders, the effect of which are being felt the world over. Indeed, in this week's IMF spring meetings are overshadowed by the impact of the war on the world economy. But the consequences of Putin's senseless war extend beyond the economy. It is also reshaping the energy landscape and triggering a shift in defense policies. I will focus this morning on the war's economic impact while also touching on its broader implication in these two areas, energy and defense, from a European and transatlantic perspective. The new crisis hit us just as our economies were shaking off the effects of the COVID-19 shock and the global recession of 2020. We started this year with the EU GDP back to pre-pandemic levels. Unemployment had reached record lows, accumulated savings were high, and business and consumer surveys were painting a picture of growing confidence. This was before 24 of February. 
This swift turnaround since 2020 stands, stands in stark contrast with the global financial crisis of 2008. Then it took about seven years for the EU economic output to reach pre-crisis level. This success is a testament to the strength and the coordination of our fiscal and monetary policy response, both within Europe, but also at G7 and G20 level. The US economy had a similarly fast and strong recovery with some differences compared to the EU due to the different safety nets and support mechanisms. Of course, as we entered this year, we were already facing a number of challenges notably rising energy prices and supply chain disruptions where they're already there, contributing to mounting inflation. And indeed, GDP may have returned to pre-crisis level, but it had not reached yet the pre-crisis trend, which is really the key indicator to consider our recovery complete. Nevertheless, the fundamentals of our economy were solid and our assumption was that these challenges would subside over the course of the year. The European economy was on course to reach its trend level later this year, 2022. And our winter economic forecast, which I presented in uh, February the 10th, so two weeks before the war, projected a 4% growth in the EU for this year. The war has shattered these assumptions and changed the picture dramatically. Surging commodity prices have driven inflation to new records. Broken trade links are exacerbating supply chain strains and confidence has been damaged. Now I'll touch on these uh, few points. First, significantly higher commodity prices, notably oil and gas, but also wheat prices among others, are putting further pressure on already high consumer inflation. In the euro area, inflation reached 7.4% in March, the highest level since the introduction of the single currency. However, this number masks significant divergence between the 19 euro area member states. Four of them are experiencing double digit inflation while in a couple, it remains more subdued, around 5%. Inflation has similarly shot up in the US, even though there are some differences when it comes to the main drivers. The largest driver inflation in the euro area are energy prices, which reached almost 45% increase last month. Let me... Re in 45% contribution to inflation last month. Let me recall that in January 21, energy inflation was still in negative territory. So from negative territory to 45% in 13 months. In the US, inflation is mostly driven by strong demand and the consumption, boom triggered by the policy response to the pandemic. However, it is also clear that inflation in Europe is becoming more broad-based. The effects of the war are adding to pre-existing drivers of price rises related to the effects of the post-pandemic recovery. At the same time, it is important to underline that inflation expectations remain anchored and that, for the moment, we see only limited second round effects. The war and its consequences, including the successive round of sanctions that the EU and US have imposed on Russia, are exacerbating pressures on already strained global supply chains. This is affecting output in a number of sectors, as well as exerting further upward pressure on prices. Explicit embargoes, implicit bans and voluntary withdrawal from trade are inevitably having an impact on commerce. This may prove particularly important from some member states with stronger links to Russia. In the Baltic states, for example, 
exports to Russia account for some 5 to 8.5 of total exports, compared to a quite low 1.8 export percent export for the EU as a whole toward Russia. So while we continue to stand by the sanctions decisions which we have coordinated with our allies, we also have to be honest with our citizens. This strategy, this response is not without price. These developments increase both the need and the likelihood that supply chains will undergo major reorganizations. Strengthening trade links with other partners will take time and may be costly in the short term. They will, however, reduce our strategic dependence from Russia. Consumer confidence has dropped markedly since the invasion, while business confidence has so far been a little bit less affected. We will need to continue to track this soft data carefully in the coming weeks and months. The first data reflecting the impact of the war will be the preliminary GDP flash for the first quarter, which Eurostat will publish at the end of April. My conclusion is crystal clear. We see a significant economic impact from the war. The global impact is particularly deep in the European Union, and the duration of the war will determine its cost, both humanitarian and economic. EU member states have started to adopt a variety of measures to tackle this crisis. These include economic and material support to Ukraine, assistance to refugees, unprecedented level of assistance to refugees, as well as continued support to the economy to deal with high energy prices and disruption in production. These initiatives will inevitably weigh on public deficits. According to our preliminary assessment, the initiatives taken by government so far for uh, this crisis will increase budget deficit by at least 0.6% of GDP this year. Overall, it is clear that the 4% growth we had projected for this year in February looks out of reach. It is too soon to reveal to how, by how much we will need to trim this forecast. I will be able to provide the first indication on May 16, when I will present our spring economic forecast. To ensure our economies, economies successfully navigate these troubled waters, we need to maintain agile and responsive fiscal policy, much like we did during the COVID crisis, but in a completely different environment. The Commission will provide updated guidance for fiscal policy in 2023 as part of the European semester spring package that we will present on May 23rd. We must also continue to implement effectively the national recovery and resilience plans member states put in place in the wake of the pandemic, the huge program that we call Next Generation EU, unprecedented common program. This is key to supporting confidence and delivering the investments and reforms our economies need now more than ever. Beyond this economic impact of the war, there are, as I mentioned, deeper implications for our policies in other areas and for the transatlantic alliance more broadly. This crisis has been in many ways a wake-up call for Europe. It is high time to reduce our dependencies in strategic sectors and to strengthen our autonomy. The pandemic has already prompted this wider rethink, especially with regard to reassessing our supply chains in key areas. But the war has drastically accelerated this process, in particular in the fields of energy and defense. 
as Secretary of State uh, Tony Blinken aptly put it recently, Russia is now using energy as a weapon. This clearly changes everything. It has sparked a seismic shift in the energy landscape. The US was quick to impose an embargo on Russian energy imports. As you know, in Europe, we have banned coal imports from Russia and are actively discussing the possibility of further sanctions involving oil and gas. This approach reflects the different exposure to Russian energy on the two sides of the Atlantic. The US is a net exporter of energy with low exposure to Russia. In Europe, 90% of the gas we consume is imported and Russia provides almost half of these imports in varying level across member states. Russia also accounts for 27% of oil and 46% of coal imports. Nevertheless, the EU has already taken very bold decisions. We have sent a clear message to the Kremlin. We will not be blackmailed. In March, the Commission announced the Repower EU plan. We have always acronyms and, and, and labels for our plans. The Repower EU plan with the goal of slashing EU demand for Russian gas by two thirds before the end of the year, two thirds before the end of this year, and to make Europe independent from Russian fossil fuel by 2027. The challenge will be to square the seemingly impossible trilemma of keeping energy prices affordable, ensuring security of supply, and pursuing our green goals. Soaring energy prices are harming the competitiveness of our firms and impacting low-income households most severely. We have encouraged member states to make use of a toolbox of measures to tackle high energy prices, from cut cutting VAT rates to providing direct support to the most vulnerable groups. This has been followed by a new temporary state aid framework so allowing more state aid for the more affected sectors. And we are discussing more far-reaching options, such as setting regulated prices. Cutting our dependent Russian energy while securing sufficient gas for next winter means we must increase imports from other suppliers. Discussion with partners have intensified in recent weeks and have led to the recent deal announced by President Biden and President von der Leyen for the US to provide additional supplies of LNG to the EU. This deal marks an important step in our efforts to diversify gas supplies and is a powerful symbol of the strength of our alliance in times of crisis. Boosting imports from other suppliers is one way to secure alternatives to Russian gas in the short term. But make no mistake, the best way to ensure we can meet our energy needs is to diversify our energy sources and reduce our dependency on fossil fuels altogether. The case for a rapid clean energy transition has never been stronger and clearer. The EU is already a global leader in this respect, but in the current situation, we need to do more, not less. And we need to do it faster. It would be a mistake to put on hold the green transition while we face this crisis. And we must avoid doing that, although we know that this is not an easy task. At the recent summit in Versailles, EU leaders tasked the Commission to present concrete measures to make Repower EU, this program, a reality. One month from now, on May 23rd, we will present this plan. As you can imagine, work is ongoing and it is too soon to share details. What I can say is that Repower EU must be backed by the necessary national and European resources. The recovery and the resilience facility that we have 
decided after the pandemic will have an important role to play. Finally, the war in Ukraine also marks a turning point for Europe's defense policy and for the transatlantic relationship. Positions that were held for decades has shifted in a matter of days. For the first time in its history, the EU agreed to deliver arms 1.5 billion and other equipment, military equipment to a country under attack. With the latest announcement from earlier this month, we have pledged this huge amount of money in military aid to Ukraine, unprecedented. In Versailles, EU leaders committed to bolster our defense capability, pledging to uh, substantially increase defense expenditure, develop joint project and joint procurement of defense capability within the EU, increase investments in technologies and innovation for security and defense, and further develop the, our defense industry. So Russia's invasion of a country bordering in NATO has also strengthened the transatlantic alliance and its attractiveness to countries like Finland and Sweden, where we have witnessed a sea change in public opinion on this matter in recent weeks, and we will see the consequence in the coming weeks. The Versailles Declaration stresses that the EU efforts in this field are complementary to NATO, which remains the foundation of a collective defense for its members. Indeed, where would we be now if the Baltic states, Poland or Romania were not in NATO? I believe that NATO's eastward expansions has actually put us in a better place to deal with Putin's history of aggressing Russia's neighbors. Boosting our defense capabilities will require significant investment in our industrial and technological base. The new defense investment needs come on top of those to deliver on the green and digital transition. We are currently working on an updated analysis of our investment needs in these strategic sectors, which will be ready with our Repower EU plan later in May. But we are talking about mobilizing hundreds of billions of additional investments each year. While most of these investments will need to come from the private sector, financing them will require a more supportive framework of fiscal rules and potentially new tools at the European level. So two years since the start of the pandemic, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has plunged us in another crisis. While its economic impact will only gradually become fully clear, its broader significance was evident from that faithful 24th of February. When Russian tanks rolled across the border, they did not just trample on Ukraine's sovereignty, but on the very notion of the international rule-based order. Ukraine is being shelled for its Western aspiration, for trying to build a liberal democracy based on freedom and the rule of law, and for seeking closer ties to the West and the European Union. This is simply unacceptable. This is why Europe and its allies have taken a strong and united stance while staying clear from a dangerous direct participation in the war, we are providing full support to Ukraine. In this confrontation, our economic resilience is crucial not just to protect our citizens, but also our model of Western liberal democracies. That is what is at stake now. This war might drag on for longer than we think, in the weeks and months ahead, we need to maintain the same unity that we have shown over the past two months, both across the ocean and within the EU. This crisis will also spell the end of globalization as we have known it and reshape global alliances. The notion of Wandel durch Handel, changing through trade, of bringing about has shown its limitation. We need to rethink our relation with autocratic regimes and strengthen our ties with like-minded partners. 
we do not need a revival of protectionism. What we need is a new and more secure globalization. The balance, of course, will not be easy to find. This year marks the 75th anniversary of the Marshall Plan, a project that was decisive in so many ways. It cemented the transatlantic solidarity. It kick-started Europe's post-war recovery, and it showed the seeds for economic integration on our continent. And when peace returns to Ukraine, we will need a new Marshall Plan to rebuild the country, better, stronger, greener, more secure, and to help it along its path towards the European Union. An immense challenge, which together we must turn into an opportunity for Ukraine, for Europe, and for our transatlantic community of democracies. Thank you. Please. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Gentiloni. Uh, thank you for your powerful close about a new stage of globalization in the context of dealing with autocracies and standing up for democracies. I think that's the challenge you and your colleagues in policy right now are facing and the one we at Peterson Institute hope to contribute some progress. If I could, I'd like to go back to some of the themes you raised in your talk, in particular on energy, on fiscal policy. Um, starting with energy, there seems to be something of a tension between one part of your speech talking about the need to cushion the blows to competitiveness and low-income low income households from the energy shock, and at the same time talking about the need to accelerate our energy transformation. And this is not, of course, unique to the EU. The US and other Western economies are talking about tax cuts or, or bailouts or subsidies for affected households and businesses. But how do we get those current policies in line with the longer term need to wean ourselves off of carbon, as you discussed? How do we view the, I know you were thinking well before these events about things like the Gilles in France a couple of years ago. How do we overcome the resistance to change, to offset climate change? Uh, well, this is uh, indeed one, one of the more difficult uh, uh, tasks for, for uh, policy uh, decisions. Um, in an abstract world, uh, the, the uh, dramatic increase of uh, prices of uh, uh, oil and, and gas um, could be only a, an accelerator of the green transition. Uh, these prices are increasing, uh, and you have to uh, push, accelerate on renewables. Of course, we, we are not living in, a, in an abstract world, and uh, this price increase is uh, affecting um, uh, some uh, sectors of business, and vulnerable households and governments need to react. And the reaction, um, in our view, is justified, uh, but should be uh, targeted and temporary. We use these two words to say that, of course, you can't ignore this. If we look to the uh, ongoing uh, electoral campaign in France uh, for, for the, 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 deuxième, the deuxième tour, right. the, the big issue is energy prices and uh, gasoline prices. And this is the main uh, um, argument in the public interest. So you, you can't, a government can't ignore this, but to cushion this impact uh, with a uh, stable, universal, and permanent decision will be completely in contradiction with our strategy. So 
Yes, you can take measures on VAT, you can uh, uh, use uh, fossil fuels for limited, uh, or LNG for limited amount of time, um, but the main work stream remains increase uh, renewables and not put on hold the climate transition. I think that this is completely shared in, well, not, not all 27 member states, but in the majority of the European countries. We, you had mentioned in, in your remarks that you and the, your team will be providing the updated forecasts for the European economies in a few weeks. Obviously, I can't entice you to give us a preview of that, but there has been a very lively debate, notably in Germany but elsewhere, about just how costly it would be for growth if there was to be a, a rapid embargo of oil and gas from Russia. Um, can you just give us some sense of how you and DG Ekfin are thinking this through? Do you, what is the role of your forecasts in this debate? Um, and what are the, in a sense, though it's not for you to say, in, but it is for you to, to shape the debate. We've seen, for example, one noted German economist say, well, we can't have a more rapid embargo on, energy, on oil and gas because it would undermine the competitiveness of our chemical industry. Um, are those kinds of concerns about sectoral advantage things that you feel European governments should be taking into account? Um, yes, I think these, uh, uh, the issue of uh, uh, dependency on uh, gas and oil uh, uh, coming, gas and oil imports, right. and then uh, Russian imports um, can't be ignored. Uh, this is completely different from the situation that uh, we have in North America, in US or in Canada. Uh, but um, I think that we are seriously working together, uh, US and the European Union uh, and other partners, to continue to have a common and united sanctions strategy. So my um, uh, first point is we should keep this attitude. Um, and I am very uh, happy to see that uh, in the US administration, uh, Secretary Yellen and, uh, and her team are uh, very much um, committed, <clears throat> committed in working with us. So we are continuously consulting um, on, on these packages of sanctions. What is sure is that uh, nothing is off the table. The possibility to uh, have further sanctions in other energy sectors apart coal uh, is there. Um, we discuss about possible embargoes. We discuss about possible price caps to uh, 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 Russian um, energy sources. Uh, we are not yet there with decisions, but it's very important to keep this method. I, I was uh, the Italian foreign minister at the time of the Russian annexation of Crimea, and I remember very well how difficult uh, it was to deliver on extremely limited packages of sanctions. In this case, of course, the situation was much more um, um, dramatic. In this case, we were fast, united, strong, and we should keep this because the war could last. So we, we have to continue with this common machine and also 
tackle the, the, the circumvention of sanctions, work together on this. As far as the uh, perspective of our economy are concerned, of course, we will uh, see the, the, uh, the data coming in our models uh, in the next uh, couple of weeks. Um, for sure, we will not have level of growth comparable to, to this 4%. But apart from the baseline scenario that we will uh, present, uh, we should know that there are some uh, downside risk that will remain. And the risks are connected to the duration of the war, to the impact of this duration on confidence, which is difficult to measure today, confidence of investors, not only of consumers, and they are also connected to the extension of the sanctions to other sectors of energy. So we will have a baseline uh, scenario in our forecast, but we will be aware of the fact that there are risks that go beyond this scenario. Thank you. Um, again, pushing you a bit, and you, you are always admirably frank, the, there are a number of commentators, I think with justification, who've looked at the parallels between the decisions on energy now in Europe and the decisions about austerity during the Euro crisis a decade ago. And some, I believe Paul Krugman in the New York Times, for example, have pointed out that much of the same rhetoric that Germany or so-called Northern Europe applied to Italy, Portugal, Spain, Greece, during that period could be applied to Germany now. You didn't prepare ahead, you, you, made, you didn't insure, self-insure against bad outcomes, you now have to suffer the costs. Yet the discussion doesn't seem to be going that way, that the, the enormous burdens that perhaps justifiably, but that undeniably your country and other member states went through in the Euro crisis we're talking about much smaller adjustments, at least for the large member states right now. Obviously, Poland, the Baltics, some of the others aren't, aren't going through a lot. Again, not trying to be incendiary, but, but as someone who's been through both these crises, I mean, why is it that the Euro crisis, it was possible to demand such extreme austerity, but it doesn't seem possible to demand such large changes in economic policy now? Uh, well, I think that w w what we are now uh, facing is a non-comparable uh, scenario with the one in the, in the 70s. Um, the, the, the situation we are we are in now is a situation where we are again in a world where um, inflation could be back a, a permanent feature of our economies, but uh, probably for several reasons, not uh, at the level and with the uh, uh, permanent uh, um, characteristic that it had in, in, the, in the last uh, uh, century. At the same time, yes, you can say, well, but after the crisis that we had in the 70s, why did you, uh, uh, you Europeans, uh, did you um, avoid any uh, strong uh, commitment for uh, energy independence? Um, my answer to this is, well, now it's quite easy to say, okay, we, we, we made mistake. No? And I can, uh, I can tell this very, very easily. But we should also, in my um, view, remember uh, that what we are living now so the dependency from Russian fossil fuels has a uh, enormous geopolitical problem affecting even our own autonomy. Right. 
was not perceived in this way 20 years ago. This was not uh, exactly the, the, the same perception. We all lived with the, the hope and the illusion of this uh, famous German uh, Wandel uh, Durkhandel was a common illusion. This is what, not something for coming from a political sector in, in Germany. It was the idea that involving China and Russia would have been uh, successful um, and maybe we were a little bit slow to understand that this was no more the case because it's 10 years that this is clear. Uh, and so now we are try to, trying to catch up with these delays and regain our energy independence. And this, I think, is the right moment to do so because the awareness is very clear and because of the connection with the climate transition. Right. So, Thank you, and I appreciate your willingness to be publicly reflective on that. Before we return to some of the fiscal aspects, of course, which is your brief very clearly as commissioner, I just want to pick up on your mentioning of China. As I know you're aware and we've discussed in various venues, the U.S. is going through its own sort of change on that, that I think there was never quite so much, um, I don't know if the word is idealism, naivete, hope, um, about changing China through trade the way Europe understood about changing Russia. But there's certainly a feeling in Washington and many parts of the U.S. that we made a mistake we, we overdid it with China. Um, we were too wishful. To what extent do you think in the circles you're moving in, in Europe, there's a reappraisal of the approach to China at this point, as well as a reappraisal of the approach to Russia? Or is Europe still seeing things differently than Washington on this front? Well, I think that there is a, a large convergence, uh, um, of course, with distinctions. And uh, the distinctions are also based in uh, some different interests. Of course, the, um, for, for the European Union, and especially for some countries like uh, Germany, uh, there is a and also Italy, but at a lesser extent towards China, we, we are talking of economies based on exports. And uh, of course, this is uh, something influencing uh, political uh, vision. But overall, I think that uh, the illusion of uh, changing an autocratic regime uh, uh, through um, trade, um, cultural exchanges, uh, uh, personal relations uh, is fading and is no more there. And the fact is that um, behind this, we have also the idea that a successful economy was um, necessarily uh, to be um, accompanied by liberty, freedom, and democracy. This was famous book of Amartya Sen on economy and democracy. No success in economy without democracy. And unfortunately, not Russia, but China is the example that this is not completely sure. And so we have to take this into account and uh, I think to make our attitude uh, and partnership uh, more uh, secure uh, with China. I'm not saying that we have, I'm not a fan and a supporter of um, decoupling, right. but of course, uh, ingenuity in uh, uh, economic relation with China is no more allowed for Europe. Thank you. Thank you, it's very astute. And that latter part you mentioned about the assumption 
that you could not have longstanding economic success or sustainable economic success without democracy was definitely widespread in the U.S. Huh? Um, before. Let, let me go back now to your core responsibilities, even though you're obviously fit to comment on many issues. So as you described in your remarks, and people appreciate, European Union has responded to this crisis, building on the COVID and the next generation EU funds and the other facilities with initiatives in defense, in energy, in dealing with refugees. All of these have fiscal implications. Uh, you mentioned in your speech the need to be agile and therefore flexible as the Europe was in 2020 with respect to COVID. But as you're doing your surveillance, which your department does on the fiscal plans of European countries, how are you taking this into account? How do you want for example, the ECB or the, or the Council of Ministers to take this into account. Is this just another one-off or do we have to impose something to get fiscal policy back into line? Do we need a capital budget? Again, I know you had started, you and your colleagues had started a discussion of fiscal rules before this, but given where we are now, what do you see as the agenda for fiscal rules or not in this situation? Yes, as you rightly said, we, we uh, started this discussion one month before the pandemic. Uh, then we took uh, uh, unprecedented decisions during the pandemic. Um, now we restarted the discussion um, before the war uh, with the idea of uh, adapting, uh, updating our, our fiscal rules. Um, I think that now we are again in a, uh, in a completely different environment in the situation we have been in uh, uh, spring 2020. Uh, what has been in spring 2020 the mechanism for decision making in the European Union? Um, it has been a mechanism based on uh, the identification of the needs uh, and of investment needs. Uh, what kind of... Uh, we have an external shock uh, having different consequences in different member states. We have to face this shock, avoiding fragmentation uh, within especially the euro area. This was the concept and the concept is again there, because we are again with an external shock um, uh, provocating different uh, divergent uh, consequences. So I think we uh, should not uh, hurry to conclusions because we are facing the emergencies, support to Ukraine, support to refugees, uh, cushion of high prices of electricity, with uh, normal uh, means of the Union and of member states. But then if we look to the mountain of investment that we have ahead of us, right. talking of energy independence, of common defense, and of what we are already doing on digital and green transition, uh, we will again work on defining the needs, and this is what we are preparing for next month. And on this basis, to open the discussion on the possibility to have uh, uh, further uh, common uh, tools to support these needs or to use existing tools. Uh, it's, it's too soon uh, to, uh, to have a conclusion of this discussion. There is also a little bit of uh, uh, demand uh, to look how the previous next generation EU is working because it was not easy to decide this uh, common debt for next generation EU and I think that our future decisions could be helped by the fact that the program is working and it is working yeah. now. So assess the needs, the investor needs, and discuss 
probably this summer on how we address these uh, new uh, needs, uh, matching the discussion on fiscal rules with the discussion of these new investment needs that we have to face. Not an easy task because at the same time the uh, environment changed and we have uh, inflation there and the monetary policy which is different from the one that we had in 2020. But I think that the awareness of the need to keep also through monetary policy uh, room of maneuver for sustainable growth and investment, this awareness is there, I think. Thank you. As I know, you're aware, a uh, number of our colleagues here at Peterson, Olivier Blanchard, Jean Pisani Perry, Jacob Kierkegaard, and myself, as well as former colleagues like Angel Ubide and German Zettelmeyer, have been peppering you and your colleagues with proposals on fiscal rules. One thing which I think they all agree on, and certainly I believe, um, building on the work of Lane and Zettelmeyer and others, is that the issuance of common euro area bonds is a very big step forward. And you mentioned the sort of the, the next generation EU and the funding for that. Um, financial markets clearly have a huge appetite for safe assets, particularly now. Um, and so it would seem like there is a lot more room to issue euro area bonds for these various investment plans you're talking about. Could you just say a bit more about what's the process going forward? Will there be more issuance in the near term? Uh, when you say we have to see how it's going, are there criteria or discussions in place to evaluate how it's going? What, what's the outlook? Well, I would say first, um, it was a, a, a success. I think, uh, well, it's not done, and the reforms are part essential of the implementation, but uh, so far it was a success. It was a success in financial markets because all our emissions were oversubscribed yeah. very strongly. Yeah. Um, how can we go forward? Uh, well, I, I don't think that uh, it could be uh, possible and I don't think it should be wise uh, to say we uh, go forward uh, prolonging this same program, what we call next generation EU, that was the COVID response facility. Um, also because from a legal point of view, this was a uh, one-shot extraordinary decision. Uh, but as always in the history of the European project, if this um, works, it can be repeated. Uh, the method can be used for the method of issuing common uh, debt for different targets for different objectives. And we, we don't lack uh, common goods to uh, defend and to support with common uh, resources. Then of course, I'm perfectly aware of the fact that the ideal solution for this could be a, should be a permanent safe asset. And this, we just finished <clears throat> the public consultation uh, on our fiscal rules and I was quite positively surprised by the fact that the three uh, mm, uh, international, not international, multilateral, uh, well, the three institutions right. contributing, the ECB, the IMF, and the OECD, um, all the three contribution were stressing the need of a permanent um, fiscal capacity. Right. So the issue is clearly there. I think knowing how the decision making in Europe function that we have to work step by step having this in mind but uh, not um, ignoring the fact that it's only gradually that we will reach this goal. 
Thank you. Um, taking that sort of longer view, uh, we at Peterson have been proud to partner with and have support from uh, DG ECFIN, your, your department at the commission for various projects on the Euro's global role, the future of the Euro through the years. Um, and this right now seems like a very opportune moment for the Euro to have a greater global role in that Europe is come together. It may not have fully fulfilled these things, but is much better about dealing with divergences in response to, to external shocks. The, the, the attractiveness of the dollar may have shifted for some people because of sanctions and then because of US foreign policy and US government activities. Your part of the commission does worry about these things, including the global role of the Euro. Is this a moment where you could see Europe getting, or excuse me, the Euro getting a greater share of international reserves becoming more important as a um, anchor currency or as, as a funding vehicle or as an invoicing currency? Is this something you would like to see happen or this is just something may or may not happen, you got other things to worry about? I think that this, uh, <coughs> has happened overall in the last, uh, since uh, the last 20 years, uh, should happen. Um, it depends, I think, on, on two different level of um, uh, strategies. One is more targeted, so we have to uh, encourage, improve, strengthen the use of uh, the euro in uh, international uh, trade agreements. Uh, for example, we decided to increase the use of the euro in uh, energy uh, agreements and the increase, I don't uh, remember now the exact figures, but the increase was spectacular in the last years. At the same time, I, I would not avoid the real point. The real point is that is, is uh, in relation to the uh, geopolitical uh, strength of uh, the European Union. Um, if we are aware that we should increase this strength, that we are no more uh, Venus, no more the, the, the herbivore superpower, right. Right. Uh, but we are able to put together uh, trade strength, uh, the single currency, foreign policy, and common defense together. I think that this could be the game changer, uh, putting the real potentiality of the single currency to a next level. So we can work on sectorial and limited measures to strengthen the euro, but overall the strengthening of the euro will come in a decisive way uh, together with a more uh, proactive geopolitical role, which is needed for the, uh, I would say for the global democracy. Right, no. and, and so with that and clearly your vision as a former prime minister, foreign foreign minister, as well as European official is quite broad. I, let, let me conclude this session um, with a question about the transatlantic alliance and sanctions and Europe's potential, as you say, to cease to be the herbivore among economic superpowers. Um, as you rightly remarked, and I completely agree, what is truly impressive and important about the sanctions so far is not so much their economic effects or even eye-catching measures like locking up the Central Bank of Russia's reserves. It's the fact that the EU, the US, the UK, Singapore, Switzerland, Japan, Korea, so many countries have come together. Do you think that there will be ongoing 
support for these kinds of plurilateral sanctions that, that the, and when the US in all likelihood comes to Europe and says, we want to sanction X behavior, that Europe is likely, I mean, obviously depends on the circumstances, but is likely to go along. The history, of course, of sanctions, as colleagues of ours at Peterson, like Huffbauer and Schott have documented, is generally not great about alliance cohesion. Uh, Iran, in the context of a nuclear deal, was a counterexample, a good counterexample. Then, of course, the Trump administration just pulled out. I mean, is there going to be a different kind of sanctions regime, de facto or de jure, between EU and US going forward? Well, I think we are working to, to increase the, the pressure through sanctions. Uh, and I'm sure that we will uh, deliver in the coming weeks on, on uh, further initiatives, not only um, further sectors, but also uh, how to improve what we have already uh, overall uh, decided. We should know that, um, well, this, we should know that we are democracies, and this is our strength, but is also something that we should never forget. So the um, public um, uh, opinion attitude towards sanctions uh, should be always a matter of uh, activity from uh, policymakers in Europe and in US. Um, we, we, we need to continuously explain that what we are facing um, with, in our economies is not a consequence of the sanctions. It is a consequence of the invasion. Right. Uh, what is creating uh, the, the, the new prices in, in your gasoline? Um, it's Putin invasion. Right. It's not the sanctions. And this is true. It's not uh, propaganda in, uh, in, uh, uh, from our side. So I am uh, confident that we will uh, continue, that we will increase uh, the pressure. I know that the Russian economy is uh, in deep recession. Uh, but at the same time, especially if the war goes on for long, we have to always remember that there are citizens, um, especially vulnerable households, that are suffering from the consequence of the war and that could be uh, influenced in thinking that this is consequence of the sanctions and not of the war. So again, in a democracy, you need to not only cooperate between Europe and uh, US, but you need to win uh, the game in your country and the consensus in your country. And the transatlantic relations are now incomparably um, in a better shape than they were three or four years ago. And this is, uh, again, a demonstration that democracy counts. It's absolutely important to uh, if the war lasts for long, to keep consensus on the strategy that we decided. Uh, unity, consensus, and involvement of third countries that are now uh, in a position of condemning uh, the war, but not at the point of um, sharing uh, the strategy of uh, isolating Russia. And we have very important countries yes. with Brazil, this attitude. Brazil, India, Indonesia. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes. And this is uh, also, I think, a, a, for, for the democracies, a, 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 an, an important task for the. It's not, I hope uh, that the, the war will finish tomorrow uh, because the 
resistance of Ukrainian can impose to Putin a, a decent agreement, but I'm not sure. Right. So we have to prepare ourselves with the democratic consensus to um, difficult months and uh, keeping the transatlantic unity and keeping consensus at home. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us today for remarks and a discussion with the European Commissioner of the Economy, Paolo Gentiloni. Uh, we are very excited to have had him and our ongoing relationship with the European Commission and particularly DG Economics and Finance and the delegation here in Washington of the European Union. Uh, as part of our Macro Week 2022, please join us later today at 1230 Eastern for our discussion with Bank of England Governor Andrew Bailey and tomorrow Friday morning at 9 a.m. Eastern for our discussion, our remarks and discussion by ECB President Christine Lagarde. But I know you all thank me in particular right now for the remarks of Paolo Gentiloni. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Grazie. Grazie mille.